My name is Vineet Krishna, and I'm with the Constitution of India.net initiative here at the Center for Law and Policy Research, Bangalore. CLPR is a not-for-profit organization that is dedicated to making the Constitution work for everyone through law and policy research, social and governance interventions, strategic impact litigation, and constitutional education. Constitution of India.net is a website that aims to make the Constitution accessible by archiving primary materials on the Constitution and its history, which can be accessed through a free, user-friendly, tagged, and searchable database. This not only includes the transcripts of the Constituent Assembly debates, but also constitutional antecedent documents like the Nehru Report, 1928. We also work to sustain this engagement in two ways. Firstly, by developing content which relies on these materials with a peg to contemporary events. And secondly, by developing constitutional educational material customized for different grade levels and tied to existing curriculum. These are then disseminated online and through our workshops. I welcome you today to the first in a series of constitutionofindia.net podcast interviews, where we speak to scholars who've made key contributions to our understanding of Indian constitution and political history, and introduce cutting edge scholarship to the general public. In this inaugural episode, we will engage with an important movement in India's constitutional development, the passing of the resolution on fundamental rights and economic and social change by the Indian National Congress at its 1931 Karachi session. The resolution contained a charter of rights, including socioeconomic rights, that would eventually make its way into the directive principles of state policy. To help us understand the political context that surrounded this landmark document, we have with us today, Professor Kama McLean. Professor Kama McLean is head of department, Modern South Asia History, South Asia Institute at the University of Heidelberg. She was previously associate professor of South Asia and world history at the University of New South Wales. She's the author of the books, titled A Revolutionary History of Interwar India, Violence, Image, Voice and Text, published in 2015, and Pilgrimage and Power, The Kumbh Mela in Allahabad, published in 2008. Her third book, British India, White Australia, Intercoloniality and the Empire, 1901 to 1947, was published by the UNSW Press. It was shortlisted in the NSW Premier's Australian History Prize. Professor McLean is also editor of South Asia, Journal of South Asian Studies, and also a fellow of the Australian Academy of Humanities and the Australia Indian Institute. We've carefully read Professor McLean's book, A Revolutionary History of Interwar India, and today's podcast will mostly revolve around the sections that engage with the 1931 Karachi Congress. Professor McLean, welcome to the Constitution of India.net podcast. Thank you so much, Vineet, and thank you so much for your kind introduction. Thank you for being with us today. Before we go into the Karachi Congress 1931 itself, I wanted to touch upon the larger argument that you make in your book. Now, as we know, a couple of days back marked the 90th anniversary of Bhagat Singh's execution, an event that propelled him into Indian folklore. And ever since Bhagat Singh and his revolutionaries have occupied a significant place uh, in the psyche of Indians for a very long time, including in film and music. Now, most Indians view the Indian freedom movement as, as comprising of two distinct strands. The first, represented by the Indian National Congress, and the second, the revolutionary movement, represented by Bhagat Singh. While the Indian National Congress was involved in Satyagraha, civil disobedience, and constitutional negotiations with the British, uh, the revolutionaries, on the other hand, engaged in underground activities and were often not shy of violence. And so the popular understanding is that these two strands never really talked to each other and never really influenced each other. In your book, you claim that this was not the case. Can you tell us why and also how you got interested in writing a history of the revolutionary movement in the first place? So, I mean, the, the second question is actually the harder one. It, it, this is the most fascinating period of history, and I think it's absolutely pivotal to laying down the groundwork for so much of, of what comes after, including, obviously, um, the Indian constitution um, in the the ground that is laid for the fundamental rights resolution in 1931. The understanding we've always had of Indian nationalism or Indian anti-colonialism is that it has been conducted in a predominantly Gandhian vein. And that was uh, along the lines of nonviolence. Now it's true that Gandhi repeatedly um, uh, attempted to steer the nationalist movement along a nonviolent vein, but um, he wasn't always in complete control of the movement and there were often 
very sharp uh, moments of political violence, um, not least by the revolutionaries of the Hindustan Socialist Republican Association, who I focus on, but also by uh, Bengali revolutionaries and others as well. So, in fact, if we actually look at the picture of Indian nationalism over a long durée, it is interwoven actually with, with sharp moments of political violence. Um, and now the British, of course, called this terrorism. Um, I prefer the term political violence. I think it's a, a, a better way to understand also that the, the violence itself was seen as um, something that was um, actually instigated by the British themselves. They introduced violence into India as a means of colonization. And every now and again, that, that violence is returned in the form of political violence. Um, so I think that's an important thing to understand is that actually it's, there's fairly consistent episodes of violence throughout the nationalist movement. Um, now, the 1930s are actually a particularly sharp rise, I think, in uh, moments of violence for a number of reasons. Um, the, the, the Simon Commission uh, coming to India, uh, an all-white commission of uh, British parliamentarians who were there to decide about India's constitutional future um, was seen by many as an insult. And many peaceful protests were actually met um, with police violence. And of course, this is how uh, the Hindustan Socialist Republican Association decides to return that violence um, by assassinating a British policeman in, in the end of 1928, in December. Um, now, what I have tried to argue in my book is that, in fact, there are, if we look very closely, very close connections between Congress members and Indian revolutionaries. Gandhi is actually the exception in this, and uh, the, the two people I focus on in my book is um, the Nehru's, Jawaharlal and also Motilal Nehru, um, which I subsequently wrote as well after the book, um, once I found more evidence of this. Um, in fact, the, the two camps, if we can call them that, were often in communication and talking to each other. Chandrasekhar Azad, for example, went to the Nehru family home in Allahabad. Um, Jawaharlal Nehru gave him funds. Uh, Motilal Nehru gave them legal advice. Um, there were very close interactions. And again, that's not surprising because a lot of um, where the revolutionaries began with their nationalist thought was with Congress. Um, you know, Bhagat Singh's father was a, an old Congress worker. Many of his friends were Congress workers. So there's actually very close relationships between the revolutionaries and the Congress during this period. Yes, and, and it seems like um, this relationship between Congress members and um, the revolutionaries um, it's quite highlighted by what happens in the Karachi um, resolution or rather the Karachi Congress in 1931. As we know, um, the 1931 Karachi Congress um, passes a resolution on fundamental rights, which, which gives a range of rights to Indians. But what was different in this case was there were also socioeconomic rights that were, that were given in, in, in strong measure. And also it proposed um, the nationalization of, of certain industries, key industries. Now, in your book, you suggest that the hanging of Bhagat Singh partly shaped the form of the resolution of, of fundamental rights. Um, could you take us through the political background of the Karachi Congress 1931, including the execution of Bhagat Singh and how these came together and uh, partly or in however measure impacted the resolution? Yeah, sure. Look, to do that, I, I need to step back a, a year perhaps or two and to um, maybe consider the Lahore Congress, where there is a real escalation, you know, during the Lahore Congress is at the end of 1929. And um, in the months preceding that, Bhagat Singh and his comrades are in jail on hunger strike. Mm -hmm. and during this period, they become extremely, I mean, famous really, um, all around uh, India in nationalist circles for their standing up to the British um, government, to their protests in the court, to their protests in the prison. And I think by the end of 1929, there is a real sense that Gandhi is actually very much aware of that um, revolutionaries who are being um, accused and trialed for their role in political violence are becoming popular in India. And his anxiety around that is actually quite concerted. Now, in that context, he, he installs uh, and puts a lot of support behind Jawaharlal Nehru, 
I think not realizing how much support um, Nehru, uh, the younger Nehru himself is actually giving the revolutionaries. And so there is a very close tension there um, between Congress and revolutionary and almost a, a melding actually of the two groups um, with one, one side talking to the other, often in secret, and even the intelligence records um, don't often pick this up. It comes out um, in a lot of oral history interviews after independence at a time when it's safe to talk about these kinds of connections. Now, by the time we get to 1931, um, Bhagat Singh has been on death row um, with his comrades Rajguru and Sukhdev uh, for 18 months. They've been um, extending the trial and becoming more and more um, uh, infamous actually in India, but also elsewhere as well. Um, the left globally, um, and including in Britain, were also lobbying to have the sentences commuted. Mm -hmm. And it's in this sort of larger context, um, you know, of course, Gandhi, uh, you know, I've missed out, but of course, Gandhi calls uh, for civil disobedience. Um, in early 1930, there's the Salt March um, and uh, a whole, you know, one of Gandhi's most famous campaigns, of course. And again, many revolutionaries take part in this as well. Um, there are negotiations in February um, with the, uh, Lord Owen, the Viceroy, to, uh, with Gandhi to, to call civil disobedience to a halt. And Gandhi does agree to do that. And Jawaharlal Nehru in particular, and many other congressmen as well, uh, and congresswomen, in fact, are really annoyed at what they see as um, a, a real escalation of the independence movement and Gandhi calling it you know, calling this truce with um, Lord Owen and negotiating. Mm -hmm. And so there's an enormous amount of disappointment among what we would now understand as um, a, a left that is actually forming within the Congress. It subsequently becomes the Congress Socialist Party, uh, just maybe one or two years down the line. And so we start to see, I mean, the Congress is not a party, actually speaking at this moment. It's a, it's a very, very broad movement with an enormous amount of political opinion within it. And Gandhi is really struggling to maintain um, coherence and control of the movement and to try to keep the narrative on this sort of nonviolent mode, which is very hard to do as long as Bhagat Singh and his comrades and the revolutionaries are not only alive, but hold enormous amounts of popularity. Now, um, it's at this moment as well that um, there are debates within, uh, particularly the left of the Congress, that we're, we're calling here for independence, but we, we don't know what an independent India will look like. How, how do we imagine an independent India? And up until this point, actually, Gandhi himself would just talk about Ram Raja, which was not a, um, you know, which is an extremely... Um, you know, it wasn't a particularly precise, and it certainly wasn't any kind of clear, um, you know, blueprint for what um, an independent India would be. Now, in fact, this is where M. N. Roy comes into the picture and the left. M. N. Roy um, is back in India during this period. He's been um, ousted from the Comintern. He's estranged from uh, mainstream you know, uh, Comintern politics. Um, and he's rethinking and reformulating how um, a, a socialist blueprint might best be applied to um, the economy of India, the, the you know, the colonized um, situation. And he writes, he's actually in the habit of writing manifestos and giving them, feeding them through Congress lines, hoping that they will get put up in Congress meetings and accepted. Um, now, in fact, a lot of them um, don't get accepted, but in 1931, he actually manages to get quite a bit of traction. And he does this through a very complicated um, series of, uh, you know, again, what we would now understand as the Congress left connections, who put forward um, a 15 point plan that he, uh, M. N. Roy, initially frames, which actually explains some of the, um, you know, very progressive and if, if not socialist um, elements of the fundamental rights resolution. And how would Bhagat Singh's execution here um, come along? Would that uh, would that be just another um, something to add pressure on to the on the Congress establishment from the left uh, um, aspects of the Congress? Yes, absolutely. Um, by this stage, um, 
there, there is a widespread presumption that as a result of the Gandhi Irwin Pact, which is finalized in March, the beginning of March in 1931, that Bhagat Singh and Sukhdev and Rajguru will be commuted, you know, commuted, the sentence will be commuted. Um, now, as we know, that doesn't actually happen. And so when the, the news of the executions um, spreads out on, and the executions themselves are on the 23rd in the evening, which is again, actually against prison regulations, um, the news spreads out fairly widely by the 24th of March. And it's the 25th of March when the Congress session um, begins to come together. So Gandhi arrives in Karachi on the 25th of March and he arrives to mass protests from youth movements um, and, elements of the left, but also, you know, the, the, the young of the Congress, mm -hmm. as well as many Congress leaders as well, um, including Subhash Chandra Bose, for example. And it's this enormous amount of anger within the Congress in itself that Gandhi has to try to mollify, and he does that through Jawaharlal Nehru. Mm -hmm. now, Nehru himself is in a, also in a, in a, I argue, a, a pivotal time of his political life actually or his political adulthood even one could say his own father has died uh, just two months back uh, not even actually I think it's more like six weeks and I think that really shakes Jawaharlal um, it leaves him I, I think until this point you know Motilal Nehru had been always able to um, keep Gandhi on a I, I think he was an effective counter to Gandhi um, with, with him gone, Gandhi comes into a much stronger position within the Congress and his relationship with Nehru in particular actually also starts to change. I think it brings Nehru under some more um, uh, control, actually, I, I think is not too strong a word. Um, and effectively what happens is Gandhi realizes that, you know, the whole point of the Karachi Congress is to put up the gandhi Owen Pact which he realizes that most people are extremely unhappy with, especially because of the hangings of the revolutionaries. And in order to try to, I think, shift that dynamic to try and um, mollify that anger within the Congress movement at the time, he asks Jawaharlal to put the resolution to the vote um, and to, to back it effectively. And the fundamental rights resolution is the quid pro quo in, in that tension. It's, act, it, it's really hard to, um, to summarize in, in half an hour. I've written about it more, um, more closely elsewhere, but it's a, a very, very interesting time in which it's very interesting to see the various, uh, you know, the complexity actually of the political spectrum and the ways in which Gandhi is trying to, um, to mobilize and, to um, to maintain control, actually, of, of, of Congress debate and, um, and and the way in which the Congress moves forward. You you mentioned M. N. Roy, and um, I think we are quite fascinated by M. N. Roy. When we first started to um, to collect materials that we could sort of term as constitutional antecedent documents to the Indian Constitution. We, of course, looked at the Nehru Report, the Government of India Acts, and of course, the Karachi Resolution. But what we found, and we weren't expecting to find, was, um, was a document called Constitution of Free India, a draft in 1944, which Eman Roy wrote. Um, and not many people know of this document, and he really takes his um, socialist um, framework very, very seriously in that document. And it's, it has a high level of decentralization, and it's a very interesting document. Also, Emin Roy is supposed to be the person who moots the idea for a constant assembly in the first place. Um, I've been trying to track exactly the moment in which the Congress picks this up, but uh, going by um, what you've written in your book of Emin Roy's influence on many of the members and how he got some of his ideas accepted and some of his draft constitutional provisions accepted by the Congress party, it might very well be the case that Emin Roy is the person who actually starts the idea for constant assembly and sells it to the Congress which the Congress then picks up and then runs with it um, for the next 15 or so years. Um, and I want to just change track a little bit. And you mentioned Nehru. Um, in your book, of course, the category of violence plays is quite central. Um, now, in this story, violence is, is um, relevant because that was the key way in which people um, thought of the 
different political strategies of the revolutionaries and the mainstream Indian, Cong um, Indian National Congress. So while the revolutionaries used violence, the Indian National Congress, in a sense, um, abhorred it. Now, in the concluding chapter of your book, you suggest that during the Karachi Congress 1931, and I will just quote from your book, you say, open quotes, Nehru's earlier pragmatic attitude towards nonviolence seems to have given way to a more ideological commitment. And I was quite interested in, 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 that, um, in that line. Could you just take us through and unpack that? Of, uh, was this something that, that occurred for other congressmen also during the time in which they seemed to um, drop the revolutionaries in a way? So this is, I mean, again, this, it's, it's such a fascinating period. And I think, I mean, Nehru is the, is the pivotal person here mm -hmm. because he is emerging as the, um, he, he is emerging actually as, as the outgoing Congress president in 1929 in the, he's stepping into the shoes of his, his uh, de departed father by this stage as well. Now, what I think is particularly interesting here, um, again, uh, more recent theorists have talked about how there's, there's two kinds of nonviolence. There's the belief in nonviolence um, because it's a, it's a practical, uh, you know, it, it makes practical sense, you know, to, to raise up arms against the British was usually a very short-sighted policy because they tended to be very well um, resourced. They could catch you and hang you as we see with Bhagat Singh and his comrades. The deeper element, so therefore nonviolence makes sense, right? It's a, it's a longer kind of um, anti-colonial strategy. The deeper sense of, of commitment to nonviolence is one that comes more from Gandhi himself and is more, um, you know, ethically, it's coming from an ethical frame point that if we deploy violence as an anti-colonial tactic, then this will actually create a policy that we do not want to inherit. Right? That's, that's Gandhi's effective program. And he, he's conflictual, actually, Gandhi's um, approach to violence, um, which, you know, I won't go into now, but he, for most part, he is actually quite, you know, determined on this point that if we use violence to get the British out of India, then after independence, we will be using violence against each other. It will become a, a political dynamic that we cannot get rid of. And I think that is a, a valid concern. Now, Nehru, in, you know, he, I mentioned he was the Congress president in 1929. He um, speaks on the dais of the, um, the presidential platform that if we need to use political violence, we will do so. And I mean, that's paraphrased, but he says more or less um, along these lines. Now, this is something that alarms um, the CID, but I think it also alarms Gandhi um, as well. And I think uh, what happens over the next 18 months by the time Bhagat Singh um, is eventually executed, um, I think he and Gandhi in particular have um, ongoing discussions about the role of political violence in the nationalist movement. Now, the other thing that happens at Karachi is that, um, you know, Bhagat Singh is, is hanged on the 23rd. On the 24th, um, when the news spreads out in Kanpur and elsewhere as well, the Congress party actually enjoins a hartal. And in Kanpur, where there's a history of communal violence, Congress workers who are predominantly Hindu try to force Muslim shopkeepers to close their stores in protest. The Muslim um, shopkeepers refuse and violence breaks out. And uh, the, the riots in Kanpur at the time uh, Actually, the, I mean, it's the worst modern outbreak of communal violence that India has seen until that point. And for the Congress, it's particularly shocking because one of their leaders, Ganesh Shankar Vijayati, is, is killed in the, in the middle of the violence. He goes to try to calm things down and he's stabbed. Um, and this creates a real shock, actually. And the news of, of Ganesh Shankar Vijayati's death is delivered um, at the Karachi Congress. And it forces all of the congressmen to think about how, you know, the anti-colonial violence of Bhagat Singh has led to what Gandhi calls a cult of, um, of deification of political violence. Mm. And this ultimately has turned into, in the protests after Bhagat Singh's hanging, um, communal violence, right? So it's kind of one form of violence, anti-colonial violence be becomes morphed into communal violence. And this is precisely what Gandhi is concerned about. And I think 
at this point where, you know, Nehru has to face the death of someone who is actually quite close to Ganesh Vijayati. He's a friend. He considers him a friend. I think it creates a real shock, actually. And I think at that point, Nehru admits that, yes, we, um, we need to remove political violence as a dynamic against the British. And that's where his discourse on violence starts to shift. So I'd like to end by, by just invoking the Indian left. Um, a lot of what your book shows us is that the Indian left, diverse be its formation back then and complex, um, definitely contributed to the constitutional development of India, directly or indirectly. Uh, but this contribution is rarely spoken about or acknowledged uh, when we speak about the Indian constitution's history. Why do you think this is the case? And do you have any other thoughts on this? Well, it's interesting, actually, Nehru himself almost disavows M.N. Roy's influence. He, he actually says, um, he, he complains when he hears about people thrusting the resolution upon him at Karachi. Um, and in fact, it, I mean, what I've found through oral history interviews is it's, it's slightly more subtle than that, but in fact, uh, you know, M.N. Roy's hand in this is actually quite clear. I can, I, I pulled out earlier today and I'm happy to send you copies of M.N. Roy's earlier statements of a 15 point um, fundamental rights resolution. And it undergoes development, but it's actually published in a, um, a, a communist, you know, a Roy group, it's not really communist, Roy group uh, publication called The Masses mm -hmm. in February of 1931. Um, and Ultimately, the fundamental rights resolution is different. There is a couple of extra things that are pulled in there. We can see, for example, Gandhi's, um, you know, some of his, you know, um, favourite points. We can see some classic, um, you know, old school sort of nationalist demands that, you know, the Indian, um, uh, you know, the, the, the army should not be used in imperial, um, you know, military adventures and, and enormous amounts of money wasted on it. Yeah. But we also see the bones of M.N. Roy's ideas and not even the bones, actually. We can see quite clearly in, in um, some of the statements of the Fundamental Rights Resolution, the original um, versions, this, I've got two versions of the document that M.N. Roy wrote. Um, I think it's, we don't talk about it because, because it was in, in a way covered over. It was put to Nehru by a number of other Congress workers, mm -hmm. um, perhaps to obscure its origins, although it's, I mean, you look, you, if you read it, it's fairly clear that it's a, a socialist program that's in the work there. And part of what we um, try to do at the project is to bring these materials out there into the, into the public. So I'm certainly going to take you up on the offer of sharing those materials and we can certainly put it up on our site so that um, students and, and professors across the world can access them. Uh, I think we're out of time. Professor McLean, I'm sure our readers and listeners have a deeper understanding of the role of the revolutionaries in India's freedom movement and the constitutional movement. I urge our listeners and viewers to read Professor McLean's book. Incidentally, Professor McLean has a new book out now on, uh, I think it's titled British India, White Australia, Overseas Indians into Colonial Relations and Empire. And we urge you all, the viewers and listeners to read it. We certainly will. Thank you, Professor McLean, for taking out the time and speaking with us. Thank you so much for your interest, Vinny. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Professor McLean. All relevant historical materials and secondary literature mentioned in this conversation will be put in the show notes, and we urge you to check them out. We encourage you to visit constitutionofindia.net to explore the origins of our constitutional republic. We plan to have more conversations with scholars on India's constitutional and political history. Do check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram pages for regular updates. Thank you and see you next time.